Welcome to week six. So in the syllabus, we have week six, and that's it. You don't see week seven, week eight. Well, when you look at week six, it continues through week seven and week eight once you start reading through in the syllabus. So there isn't a, a separate seven and eight, just so you know. Um, week six takes care of all of that. So one of the things I have you do is crisis management, a FEMA activity, and then you get a certificate afterwards. You might ask, why in the world am I, am I having to do this FEMA course? Um, you know, what, what sense does that make? Well, there's a few reasons for that. I mean, first, first of all, uh, FEMA has produced some, some outstanding independent course materials. And the course that you are going to, to take, I mean, it take it two, three hours to complete max, but it's something I would seriously recommend that you have your entire administrative team do, even if you do it collectively, like during an in-service. You know, let's say that, you know, you have eight people on your administrative team and you bring the modules up on the screen ahead of you and, and you kind of go through it. Um, here's, you know, think about this. You ultimately, you know, you're, you're responsible for making sure that in a crisis situation, whether that be, um, you know, the factory two blocks away has a fire and now there's toxic chemicals being released. So, you know, all the students have to stay indoors and everything's shut down, you know, to a tornado, to an active shooter, to whatever. But, um, you know, a situation where, you know, you have to evacuate a school because there's now a leak in a, in a gas main, which happened, again, I was a director and a snowplow came up and pushed the, the gas main outside of the school and chopped it off and also natural gas is coming out. So all of the you know, fire departments called, but all the students had to be taken and relocated to a um, offsite as a, in the middle of winter elementary building. We did have a plan for that, but, you know, you're going to walk into a situation where there might not be a plan. You might say, ooh, I'm not sure what we would do if we had a bomb threat here and we had to evacuate where we would go and how we would do that. And even with our bus company, how they would get enough buses, you know, what their plan is and, and their turnaround and time and all of that. So, um, but anyway, ICS gives you a good idea of, of how the command systems work when there are events that include fire, police, EMS. Because typically there'll be situations where, you know, once fire are on scene, you know, let's say it, like that gas leak, you know, they're gonna take over, but then, I mean, you're, you're still responsible for that student body. And as a student service director, you might have students in there who have type one diabetes, who have fragile medical needs, trach, whatever. And now they're offsite. You have to make sure, you know, did their medicines travel with them? Did support travel with them? Um, you know, what, what means do you have to get extra support over to where they're at? And, you know, that people think about, you know, that that's automatic and it's not. I mean, so again, you need to, understand instant command system and that, you know, police and, and fire and what their role is going to be, but they're really not there to help you and the students. They're there to handle the situation. And if you really get, you know, blunt into it with them, and, and I've, you know, I work closely with police and fire, you know, it's not that they don't want to, you know, help in that, but right now they're occupied in this. So as a student service director, you want to make sure you know what's going to happen and that staff know what's going to happen and that they have a plan um, for uh, students with disabilities, English language learners, people, again, that, you know, are going to be under your umbrella of services. And, you know, how are you going to make English language, the parents of English language learners, you know, aware if there is a, a whole school evacuation and, you know, buses are going to be, you know, running late or, or you know, some event and there's a staging area, you know, who's going to communicate that out? And, things to think about ahead of time. In one of my, my districts, you know, we, we had, we totally didn't know where our offsite um, evacuation, you know, places were. And some of them we contacted and they had no idea 
that we were connected with them and even you know like who had a set of keys and who didn't and should we have things there ahead of time like you know some blankets or some provisions and you know it, it's just crazy but and also talking with the bus company and the bus company saying "Ooh, i'm not sure how we would get enough buses we'd have to call like the neighboring so i'd have to have a plan for, you know so these are things you, they work great in tabletop exercises which i'm a big fan of uh, you can google those and find a number of those um, they, they help you reveal issues like this you know these questions and where you can answer them now versus when they actually happen but uh but again make sure you know you you can use that and ask yourself all the way through that class as a student services director how would this impact me at this level how would this impact me how would this impact me and i say you like you and the students that you serve and um there's another you know there's a the issue of what's called cognitive offloading meaning you will have some students um you know let's say a student with a severe cognitive disability where someone's going to be assigned to take care of that student during a during a crisis you know situation or you know if there's a fire that they take them to the, the safe spot of the building and then you know that's the first place that firefighters go and whatever but that cognitive offloading isn't discussed a lot at IEP meetings. And actually, I think it should be discussed at every IEP meeting when you have a student, um, you know, where you're, you're not quite sure if they're, how they're gonna respond, um, you know, a student with a cognitive disability, autism, you know, whatever, in a crisis situation. So are you going to assign, you know, someone, and that someone might not always be there, but is it gonna, you know, be that, yes, you know, these students are going to be supported by adults, or you can even have other students help students out of the building, you know, things like that during a, during a fire drill. But you want to have that discussion about cognitive offloading because I, I can, you know, tell you that it's not good to question, have those questions once the event has already happened and say, oh, we should have, we should have anticipated that, you know, Billy was not not going to handle, you know, leaving the, the site very well. Um, you know, make sure to, I mean, things like this, you know, people service, your communications, your radios, things like that work. But um, so, you know, I would, I want to go back. Uh, so we talk about crisis and crisis management and, you know, active, active shooters and, and things like that. Um, one of the things that that happens after um, a shooting, a school shooting. Well, here's what typically, after Sandy Hook, there were 450 bills that came out within the months after that. A number of them were absolutely ridiculous. It's from a, from an empirical science base, but um, anyway, one of the things that, one of the pressures that will come out Remember when Sandy Hook happened, Adam Lanza, uh, high-functioning autism. And soon there were reports saying, are high-functioning students with autism more likely to be school shooters? Whoa. I mean, now, as a student services director, you're going to have parents coming in and asking you that, staff asking you that. And you have to be very, very careful to not get down the road of profiling. One, there is no profile of a school shooter and that's in the pbs presentation so i don't want to address a lot here but when things happen especially happen close by um, you're going to get sometimes even board members uh, other principals um, community they're going to want some assurance that the school district is identifying uh, the students that are at risk to you know to come in and to shoot up the school well that just doesn't it doesn't work that way and if you actually did a profile uh, and there are there's companies out there that sell these things so you as a student service director I mean do not go down this road at all I mean there's one thing to do a threat assessment if a student has made a threat to harm himself or others but if you're doing some global profile assessment or whatever you're going to identify your at-risk kids you're going to identify your goth kids and whatever 
And the kids who are already kind of on, on the fringe of the social spectrum, you know, for the in-group, now you've definitely put them not only on the outside, but you've also put a target on them of saying they need to be watched because they could, you know, they could be our next school shooter, you know. So don't do that. One of the things I remember of working last year um, at church after Christmas and, and helping taking down, you know, the decorations and stuff is, you know, one of the kids who was there helping, completely high school kid, guy, nice, nice kid, completely goth. I mean, earrings and everything black. I mean, so if you just look at him, I'm like, throws you a little bit. Nicest kid, nicest kid. He's there vacuuming, cleaning things up. I mean, and he did this on his own, wanted to do this, but he was goth, I mean, kind of his thing. You take that kid after a school shooting, and you start to get into this thing of, well, we're going to check, we're going to have some process, we're, you know, we're going to check through our student body to, to try to figure out who's going to be, who could be at risk to do something like this. That kid's going to get identified. So do not, by any means, support anything that has um, a, a feel of profiling to it. So there are new OCR requirements, Office of Civil Rights, for um, if a student is the recipient of a, of a threat or bullying um, or the author of that, there's what's called motivating factors. That wasn't looked at so much before, and I do talk about this in a video from December 2015. So you don't, you know, watch that, watch that video and you'll learn more about it. But just be aware that, you know, you are going to need to, again, report stuff out to OCR on an annual basis and how you do your investigations will, are changing now to really get into the motivating factors, which I think is good because you hopefully can identify some root causes because typically what we do is we identify, we respond to direct causes. So yeah, you know, student, you know, drew a, you know, swastika on another student's locker. So we suspended them for three days. So direct cause, you know, but why did they do that? Well, you know, maybe, you know, that's being covered right now and they're, they're, the information they have is incomplete. They're, they're idolized, you know, they're idolizing, you know, the Germany of the 1940s and, and whatever. And, and, you know, so really the, the causal factor in this case is that the child, you know, has, doesn't has incomplete information and has been drawn into, you know, maybe some of the, the hype that actually, you know, overtook an entire country back in the forties. So they just didn't, they didn't know. Maybe, and you could say maybe they did know, but again, I mean, you get it causal factors. If you just sit there and you, you suspend, um, you're direct, it's a direct cause. You're, you're deal, dealing with a direct cause. It'd be better to take that student and try to get at a root cause of, if it's understanding, get a restorative project in place. And then try to see if you've got patterns going on or, or whatever. And, you know, then counselors can work on certain things, um, displaying, you know, more acknowledgement of different ethnic, you know, groups and throughout your school. You know, here, here's one of the things too is, you, know, you can walk through a school, there's a, there's free site surveys from safe havens. And Mike Dorn is one of the national safety experts, actually um, helped design the engineering building down at UW-Madison. Um, great guy, wrote a book, Weak Fish, which I recommend, you know, you read. It's, it's about when he was bullied as a kid, and kind of how it led him to be who he is today. Uh, which is a world expert in school safety. But, um, you know, you can do free site surveys and download them. And it's a good thing to do because every five years you have to do like a comprehensive non-discriminatory report for the state anyway. But walk through the schools and just take a look. I mean, are you acknowledging, what, what do you see? I mean, do you see trophy cases for athletics? Are you seeing recognition of, you know, forensics, of band? of you know gay straight alliance of math club i mean what what's there and that'll give you a pretty good idea of of kind of where you know what the message is that's being communicated to students um 
I did that with one school, and we did a walkthrough. It was like almost all, it was basically just a shrine to athletics. I mean, even as we went through the lockers, you know, posted up on the lockers, like whether it be volleyball or, you know, football or whatever it was, you know, the person and the drawing, you know, and the, you know, good luck in the game. And, but there was nothing, you know, for the kids who were in forensics or, or other things or math club. I mean, it wasn't even a bulletin board. So, you know, it was, it was very much, um, you know, you could tell you were in the, in club if, if you were in athletics and if you weren't in athletics, um, there was definitely, um, a different feel and, and kids would, when we talked to kids, they reported that out too. And what that school did then is they, they worked to make sure that they were representing more of their clubs and their student involvement did a nice job with it actually and even went so far as to um, work with their food service and have different um, ethnic meals throughout a month um, I mean it was it was pretty cool so I, I I call it the first 50 feet test if you can walk into a school your student services director you walk into the, the school in the first 50 feet you should see a recognition of the student body and then the neighborhood that is served by that school. So, um, you know, meaning that you're not going to see all athletic trophies, that you're going to see maybe a flag, you know, some different flags of different cultures of students, you know, that go to that school. You're going to see artwork from different students. Um, you're going to see shared school mottos, you know, be safe, be respectful, you know, whatever it could be. But you're going to see a variety of things, a variety of artwork and and um you know even different cultural things you know but that's the first that's i call it the first 50 feet test and i will do it with administrators and it's amazing because you you can get into a building or, or else you'll see here's another thing i've seen like you walk down the hallway and it's you know you got the pictures of the president or something like that and i remember once we had a diversity meeting and and one of the issues was um it was a district that was disproportionate in identifying too many um, African American students as being um, for suspensions and emotional behavioral disability, and and we talked about you know trying to rep be more representative. Not only that, but just in general, the school was, was pretty heavy on, on athletics. Um, we were meeting in, in the library of the school, and all of a sudden looking around, and completely circling the library are pictures eight by tens and it's all like presidents and it's like you know Amelia Earhart and I mean Einstein and but I mean it's not representative at all I mean it's basically all white people from years ago you know that that had you know accom accomplishments and and not recognizing um, you know more comprehensively the uh, contributions you know from different cultures and different people and it, it it was just one of those aha moments where we we all just kind of looked around and said oh my goodness I mean look so we made a change there and you know became more representative and and you know just those subtle messages that that are present so as a student services pupil services again you know think about these things um, there is Peer Wisconsin, I believe I have a link to it, P-I-E-R. It's a parent group that formed, um, they have some different pages, but one is on uh, bullying resources. And so it's an organization that operates outside of school districts. So, you know, there's kind of a bias to it. But what you want to do is to be aware of where parents are getting their information too when it comes to bullying and harassment because through the internet there's a lot that they can they can access but I think some of the harder things happen when you have local initiatives which start which get the pseudo feel of being affiliated with a district An example that I share is um, you can I do have a link to this but there's there's an initiative in the city of Janesville led by um, a lady who graduated from Janesville Craig and it's called Be a Rooney. And I say it because it was it was on TV. There was a, it was on like 
Channel 3 out of Madison. She has a, a website, and I, I put like at the GoFundMe link, but there's some other things. But she is, I believe, you know, probably 30s or, or 40, and talks about when she was young in school and being bullied and how this, this boy, whose last name was, I think, Rooney, walked with her to school and, and kept her positive and, and how that made such a difference, you know, in her life, you know, offset the, the bullying that she had encountered. And you kind of get the feel from when you watch the TV presentation and when you visit the website that she's working with the district on anti-bully efforts and, you know, um, but really that's, that's not, that's not the case. So in, in that situation, I know firsthand from the district, um, the district is not, um, does not have a partnership with her on any anti-bullying efforts. Now that doesn't mean the district is against her or that she's, you know, that, that there's, that, you know, it's polarizing or something like that, but you want to make sure that you're aware of things going on like, like that, because if people are affiliating themselves, or it seems like there's this affiliation with the district, uh, you want to be be clear in stating if there is or if there isn't. And people have the right to do what they they you know want to do, um, but in this case, I I think it did create a situation where um, it it did. It did leave a feel, especially when I watched it, it gave the feel that this person was working with, with the district. I had a situation where a mom um, wanted to bring in presenters to, and she was going to set everything up, presenters to talk to parents about, you know, working with ch children with ADHD to um, diabetes, you know, to what whatever. I mean, and, you know, she was... An optimistic, um, very assertive person, but you know, one of the things that I sat down with her and said was, you know, first of all, I'm not going to give you school space for, to you just to pick a presenter on your own to come in and to present a message that looks like it's affiliated with the school on, you know, how to manage like you know, insulin or something. I think the mom was going to do it herself. And again, she was doing it from her own experience, not a, from not being a nurse or anything like that. It's like, whoa, you know, like that's, that's liability. And, and plus, I mean, I'm willing to work with you, but you know, I, I, you cannot represent as if, you know, you're being endorsed by the school. Uh, what this parent ultimately did was rent space at the VFW and hold, you know, workshops and, you know, had parents attend, um, and, you know, some of the things presented wasn't in line with what, you know, we were doing as a district for student services, but at least I was aware of it. And, you know, you're going to have things like that. People have a right to, to free speech, but you also want to make sure very clearly people aren't assuming an affiliation, you know, with you if it's, if that's not indeed the case. It's kind of funny as a student services director. I had a, uh, a group of moms, they were the coffee clatch moms, I think they were called. And it could have been dads too. They opened it up to, to dads, but none of the, the men would go to it. And it was about five moms. And typically, like these were the mothers of, of uh, kids with pretty intense mental health or behavioral um, needs in the district. And they got together every two weeks, early in the morning, like two hours, and they had coffee. And they would talk and kind of get their their frustrations out. You know, not only if they have frustrations with school, but if you know frustrations with the county and, and just in, in their own dealings with you know tr their their child and you know their family dynamics. It, it was a support network. Um, and you know sometimes they weren't in agreement with something that the district was doing or that I was doing, and other times they were. But I had I made sure that I went to the the leader of the group and you know i had a good discussion with her and totally respected her i mean everything you know comes down to respect and said you know and, and they weren't representing that they were affiliated with the school at all and i said you know i'd be glad to come to any meeting and just listen and i said anything you say 
you know, just be there as a as a listener. I mean, not that I can change anything or that I'm even going to take offense to anything, but if you want me, or if there's something that really is is on you know your agenda or something brewing that you want me to be aware of, um, that I might you know be able to help out with. And she said to me, "I appreciate the offer, but you know part of the reason this works is because you know administrators aren't involved. The school isn't involved. We can talk freely. We can you know amongst ourselves and." and share our experiences and be a support and and you know so it's best if you aren't involved in this which to me i was totally fine with and it was a respect level again and i knew that um you know that this wasn't a group getting together just to, to bash the district or anything like that um but you know it was something i was i was aware of and i knew the parents that were that were in it and even you know sometimes i I even I asked the mom. I said, "Is it okay if I, in certain cases, you know, make other parents aware of your group, and ask them, you know, give them your contact information, if that would be okay?" And you know, she said, "Yeah." So, um, you know, it's interesting how stuff like that works. But don't try to micromanage your entire community as a student services director. And another example I had was one of my special education teachers um, got bashed pretty well, pretty thoroughly on Facebook by a parent and uh, immediately, you know, wanted, you know, the, the posts to come down and was very upset. And of course, you know, it is upsetting, but, you know, the parent had freedom of speech to do that. It was not uh, sharing of confidential information. It wasn't profane. Um, you know, so it was one of those things too, of educating staff of, of saying, you know, this stuff happens. I mean, it used to happen where someone would, you know, maybe talk and, and gripe about it, you know, school or something, if they were outside, you know, mowing their, their lawn, but you know, now social media has changed that. Um, what I did do though is, is I did, I did contact that parent and I met with that parent and said, you know, you know, this, when you post stuff like this out there, it, it really gives, first of all, it's undermining to the teacher. And I think it doesn't represent, you know, maybe it represents an experience that you've had, but now you're, you're, you know, getting all these other people to see this, this post and, and they're starting to, you know, lose confidence in the school and, and whatever. And, you know, just so you're aware of this, but then also like that, that you're impacting, you know, when you make this, the teacher really takes takes this personally um, versus you know did you try to talk to the teacher or say can I come in and, and you know voice these concerns instead of you know getting them out on Facebook and having it forwarded 10 times time, times 10 times 10 times 10 the parent did take the post down um, but didn't have to so but that's another thing as a student services you know director to you know, kind of be aware on social media, um, you know, what's being, what's being blogged and what's being posted out there, you know, just so, just so you can, you can understand if, if certain staff are being targeted or, you know, experiencing, you know, frustrations with certain groups of parents, whatever. Not that you'll be able to do a lot, but at least to be aware. Um, so the review your First of all, Gay Straight Alliance, I don't know if your school has one, and they've kind of broadened out now with um, um, transgender and, and, and so forth. But one of the things you know you want to do is make sure that you're embracing being the champion for all students. So, you know, if you don't have a Gay Straight Alliance and you have, you know, that right there I would say that that would be something as a student service as director and, and there are the DPI has resources for this, but you know, you'd want to work to bring that into your district and actually even broaden that out, you know, transgender or even like just diversity appreciation, um, whatever it is. But there are districts where, and this is just recent, um, you know, student services directors come to the board and said, you know, I want to start a, a, a GSA. I want, you know, to back that and the board said no. Um, and then, you know, as a as a student services director, you know, you've got to make a decision of how are you going to 
to you know advocate for that or you know is it a situation where this isn't the district for you i mean there was a, a another uh situation where the the gsa actually was formed by a group of parents because the district didn't support it and then they met off campus now again you know most of this is being accepted mainstream and but again you're, you're going to find where you know some people just hold personal beliefs that um you know that they will they will stick to very strongly so every student needs to feel accepted in your school and that is that is your position of where you're coming from always make sure you review your sexual harassment policy make sure that kids understand it plus the harassment policy and do for kids you know what i what i tell uh counselors and principals and cover that right away at the start of the school year like right away the first couple of days and it, it isn't enough anymore to you know give a handout of okay here's the student handbook so you've got it so you understand what the policies are great you know you need to to understand and maybe you know even demonstrate here's what a comment would be which could be sexual harassment or you know here's what a post might look like or something like that on social media i mean be explicit i mean not to the point of graphic but i'm saying um what's going to happen then is when a student does get called out on something like that um the question will be well did they really understand that that was a violation of the code of conduct and then it's on you to prove that they they did or at least that you know they they had that awareness and if you're saying well you know we have it in the handbook you know that that doesn't go very far i can tell you especially once a lawyer gets involved so um do that up front you know with kids cover those things um dp dpi website is uh is changing right now so you'll again see some links i put out there for safe and respectful schools um and i also posted some sexual harassment response letters and investigation letters that i had written over the years and you can kind of look at those and get an idea of what you might be asked to do again most student services directors or people take that role people services special ed um you know you're going to be doing this if there's a harassment complaint that comes in you're going to be the one you know doing the investigation and you need, you need to have follow-up documentation so those forms can help you um Every five years, you're required to do a non-discrimination report. The DPI has a template. I, I put one up that I did a few years ago. And one of the things I would, and you can see what I did, there's different ways to do it, and then it has to be shared with your board and actually put on your website and, and submit it to DPI. One of the things that I've learned is I would make sure that I knew every club and sport in how students were eligible for participation. Um, for example, if you have only 30 people who can make show choir, then how do you determine which 30? And you know what's your rubric for, for doing that? And how do you accommodate then students with disabilities so they have an equal chance? I mean, because for example, I mean, student in a wheelchair tries out for the baseball team. Well, you know, they're probably not going to make the varsity baseball team. But then if you don't have a rubric and a means where you've had, you know, the criteria to make of, you know, being able to catch so many balls hit in this direction and, you know, whatever it is. And if you don't have that laid out and that's just arbitrary, you're saying, well, because they're in a wheelchair, they can't do this. That's discrimination. Um, now, I ran into a situation as a director where a student tried out for show choir and it was um the student had autism was largely main not mainstream but in, included um but the the student had tried out for show choir along with you know maybe 60 students total well you know 30 made it 30 didn't this student was in, in the group that didn't uh the parents uh, filed a complaint and said that the student was unfairly um, excluded because of his disability and that this was discrimination. So it actually got to be very complicated. 
Thankfully, the staff member who was coordinating show choir um, did have a team of four judges, had documentation on how she had trained the judges and the you know the rubrics that they had for determining determining you know um, who got in and, and who didn't and this this student there it was you know had the choir materials ahead of time and there really wasn't anything judge that could have been done differently for this student as an accommodation um, you know just that student didn't make the cut now so in that regard you know we were okay as a, as a district still felt horrible because uh, you know the parents were unhappy and but you want to make sure that one you understand what your your cut criteria are and how that impacts students with disabilities and the second one is you want to make sure that you have activities that don't have a cut criteria so everyone can participate in you know um you know whatever basketball or, or everyone can participate in this club or whatever there's there's no so you want to make sure that you balance that out but anytime you have where you're going to have more people try out than the people that are going to qualify you need to really have that process identified with rubrics and training and have all of that documented of like who was trained how they were trained have that on file because this is becoming more and more and more um, prevalent where where parents will challenge and you know if you can accommodate it um, you know that that's great um, you know schools that have a cheerleading squad and the a cheerleaders in, in a wheelchair or something like that I mean that's but if there's a if there's a cut criteria and a student isn't making a, a cut criteria then you know you have to understand what that criteria is and be able to communicate that out. In this case, if we, if that boy, um, if we wouldn't have had that documented the way we did, we would have really had ourselves in hot water for um, probably an OCR complaint. And I'm not sure how we would have fared in that. So, um, and it, you know, I think everybody felt really bad that that's the way that the parents and, and the child felt. I mean, so, when you do your, um, yeah, when you do your 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 non discriminatory report, you know, include things like that and be be really candid, you know, with where things are at. Look at your threat input system and you know, say like, here's where it's at. We can improve it though in the future by doing these steps. I do have an example from the Edgar School District. Uh, I did post an article. Um, Edgar is near where I grew up, but they had a student uh, complete suicide. And left a note um, per an article which I posted. The student indicated he was bullied, that contributed to the the suicide. This was a year ago. But what went on afterwards was kind of a back and forth between the parents and the school district, and, and you know trying to figure out you know who knew what when. So you know there wasn't a formal reporting system. And one I I mentioned is Sprigio, and I do have a link to that in the syllabus, but to objectively know if reporting has been done by the student and then also reporting in general so you can look at you know trends of of um, if there's bullying or, or harassment or threats and, and address those but you run into a situation where it becomes a you know who knew what when and what was said and what wasn't said and that really um, it, it, it's already a raw situation and it, and it just it can rip a community and rip a school apart and can be the end you know of an administrative career in that in that district for example if if an administrator you know had was aware of a student um you know who was being bullied and, and wasn't and took no action and i'm not, not saying that's what happened in this case but i'm saying let's say that you know if there was a situation like that um i mean that and that came out to be, you know, you found emails from the student or something to that effect of saying, and then nothing was done as a follow-up. That would, wow. So you want to make sure that your threat reporting system is robust, intact, and I would say electronic so you have a record, and then also a record of your response of how that was investigated and then the conclusion. 
Um, I post a K-12 scope and sequence. I think it's a great idea to do that with your counselors to indicate and psychs, you know, probably, but look at what you're doing at every level, kindergarten through 12. You can add early childhood if you, if you want to promote school connectedness or positive school culture. And look where your holes are. I can tell you the one that I posted, which I think is from 2012. When I first started that, there were holes in some grade levels where there was almost, you know, nothing that was being done that then we had to fill in. But that document had served me very well over the years when parents would ask or would say, nothing's being done in the district to address bullying or not enough or school culture or, you know, whatever. And I would be able to refer to that document immediately and say, you know, I appreciate, you know, your, what you're telling me. I want to share with you, though, things that are being, that are being done and have been done. And, you know, we continue to look to expand this out and whatever, but what you're, what you're saying is incomplete. And, and let me tell you about the activities. So I would definitely do that K-12 scope and sequence. Um, I talked about Justin Patchen. He's a professor. I, I don't know which four-year university, I forget, but he's also um, the head of the U.S. Cyberbullying website, but P-A-T-C-H-I-N. Google his name. He can, you, know, you can bring him into your school sometimes, get a PTO to sponsor or community, and, and does a wonderful presentation on cyber safety. I have some documents about abbreviated school days. The DPI has since kind of posted their own documents. So my documents, um, which I produced with an attorney, uh, you can read and, and kind of get some idea. Um, but one of the things, I guess, with an abbreviated school day is if you do create an abbreviated school day, you need to have a plan for how you will return a student to a full, a full school day, hopefully. So what happens usually is the school day gets abbreviated and then there's no plan to get back or not a realistic plan. Like, you know, student needs 21 consecutive days of not getting a referral. Well, you know, come on. So, um, but that's, a again, a slippery slope. And once you get in and, and as a director, I mean, there's things you're going to discover. And one might be that, you know, you have a number of students on abbreviated school day. And again, the thing is, if you do that, first of all, is it really helping as far as is the behavior really better if they're there two hours a day versus a full day? Maybe it is, but I mean, maybe it's not. Um, but uh, you really need, you know, good rationale for doing that, like good data saying, Okay, we've tracked it, and once a child gets to noon, most of the referrals are in the afternoon or whatever, and we know the morning's a better time. But if you don't have stuff like that, you just arbitrarily cut the time down. No, don't do that. And also be careful. You're not doing something like abbreviating a school day. Um, you know, so you're getting the child out on a bus early or getting them out so they're not having to deal with the congestion or whatever of, of you know, the bus area. That, that sounds good, and it probably makes a lot of sense in a lot of regards, um, but there's been due process complaints filed in where parents says, you know, my, my kid's school day is 10 minutes shorter than every other kid's school day, and then the school ends up having to do compensatory ed. So, you know, just kind of keep these things in mind. Um, and, yeah, you know, something too, and this, this I'll wrap it up here, but one thing that's happening more and more is parents are are coming to administrators or coming to student service directors and saying, this other parent has posted this comment about me on Facebook. So it it's not that you're seeing kid versus kid, you're seeing parent versus parent, and the parents want you to jump in and officiate that. Absolutely do not do that. Um, you know, that is for the parents to work out because once you, you put yourself into that role, that'll be never ending. Um, you know, people need to, to solve, parents need to solve their own issues. Now, of course, you know, if there's a threat made or something like that, the parent, you know, you need to have them take that to law enforcement. But, um, you know, it's amazing what social media has done, um, not only to kids, but to adults. And, uh, you know, I, there's, there's what's called, you know, the Facebook fallacy. And I'm not on Facebook. Um, 
one of the reasons is I, I personally fell victim, you know, to the Facebook fallacy where you kind of get in this where, where you think everybody else has a better life than you do. I mean, meaning they're taking trips or, you know, whatever, and they're doing exciting things and not necessarily that they have more things than you or whatever, but, you know, we're always posting our best side on Facebook. So I'm sure things that I would post, like a family picnic or something, someone might look at that and, you know, but I get into to this whole thing, this research done by Steve Kastner out of NASA, in my OCR presentation, and, and you know, I think Facebook has a potential to be very, you know, detrimental to kids. I mean, but you're not going to get them off of it, but also very detrimental to adults and, and you know, very externally, you know, changes you to externally being, um, you know, feedback and, and motivate it. And, but it can be this this tool that you hide behind and you kind of attack people and you see parents doing that that would never do that um, face to face. So don't get brought into that. All right. Um, appreciate your time and uh, I will see you next week.